programs possible. Tonight on Talking Politics, the U.S. Attorney for Massachusetts, Rachel Rollins, is under investigation by the Justice Department's watchdog over her appearance at a DNC fundraiser and other possible issues. So just what are the rules and are they different for different people? But first, while the Republican Party and no doubt more than a few pollsters are analyzing why the anticipated red wave didn't materialize quite like they expected on Tuesday, here in Massachusetts, the midterm election results were no surprise. Thank you to the people of Massachusetts. As you know by now, Democrats swept all of the statewide races from governor on down, and they retained near total control of the state house, bringing the state back to single party rule. With many of the margins of victory in double digits, it's clearly the will of the voters. But what does it mean for the future of Massachusetts politics? I'm joined by GBH senior political editor Peter Kadzis and Steph Solis of Axios, co-author of the Axios Boston Newsletter. Thank you both for being here. Good to see you. Steph, I want to get you to comment on some uh, remarks that Maura Healey made when she was meeting with Governor Charlie Baker after winning election and was asked how she's going to govern the state compared to how he governed the state. Let's take a look at what she said. The microphones are going to be a little lower. There you go. There you go. And the rest, and the rest we'll see. Well, you know, you're, we're all going to see. I think we have a lot of mutual respect for one another. Um, obviously, we, we share some similarities. We, we share, share some differences. And look, at the end of the day, it's going to be uh, matter by matter, issue by issue. You know, there's a lot of things that we've got to take on. There's a lot of things that we've got to work on and tackle. Um, Kim and I look forward to doing just that. Steph, Healy was cagey on this topic during the campaign, but now she's got the job. What do you make of her remaining as vague as she's remaining? Well, for one, as a short person, I can definitely relate to the microphones <laughs> being shorter. Empathetic, high, yes. high emotional intelligence. Yes. Um, I will say, would have been a good opportunity uh, to at least mention sort of one of the big questions everyone has, which is, what are your first steps regarding transportation? I mean, we have a GM who's leaving right in January, an MBTA that is still in a perilous position following a federal inspection. Um, so there, that is top of mind for a lot of people. Looking more broadly, it, it'll be interesting to see whether she continues to focus on the middle ground or how she responds to some of the demands of the progressives who are challenging her in the primary season. And those progressives, while they're not the majority of voters, they are a defining faction of the Democratic Party. So they could easily become some of her sharpest critics. Peter, uh, do you agree with Steph's assessment when it comes to Healy's vagueness, or do you see other things at play? I don't disagree, but I come at it from a different angle. First of all, um, Healy and Charlie Baker temperamentally are very similar people. I mean, I think after Healy's been in office for six or seven months, we may remember Governor Baker as being rather chatty compared to a, a relatively huh. tight-lipped Attorney General, as she's been as Attorney General. Um, I take Steph's points about the issues, but I think Maura Healy's going to be very careful to avoid the mistake the uh, Deval Patrick administration made, which was going public with grand plans before consulting with legislators. Um, let's not forget there's um, an inherent tension built in with an all democratic um, state house. And the Speaker of the House constitutionally has more power than the governor. So um, an all democratic state house presents some very different challenges. Let me get you to elaborate on that a bit. One of the arguments for any Republican to, to win in this election cycle was, well, there needs to be some sort of check from the other party on Democrat-dominated Beacon Hill. Obviously, voters didn't go for that. So how much of a difference do you think it's going to make going forward that there is no Republican in the corner office to rein in the legislature, which is completely, they have a veto-proof majority, they can do whatever they want, could under Baker and will be able to under Healy too. Will that be important? 
Um, yeah, my gut is the first two years, or at least the first year of the, the next two-year session, will go pretty smoothly. I mean, there's broad agreement on the, the big issues in Massachusetts. But moving forward, I, I would look, here's, here's where I take my clue. Take the two ballot questions. Number one, um, the, the millionaire's tax. That passed 52 to 48. So there's a four-point margin of difference there. Take uh, question four on the migrant driver's license. That passed 54 to 56. So there's an eight point difference there. That, that averages out to 6%. I would say that Healy to govern successfully has to keep that 6% in mind. Those people who are, you know, relatively moderate, they're, they're not, but they, they tend to be more conservative. Um, that's the sweet spot for her. Just 6%, you know, but it's that 6% margin that I think she has to pay attention to. Okay, so you're saying those ballot questions could provide a, a built-in structural check on uh, Healy moving forward, maybe not, I'm, I'm paraphrasing incorrectly, I see you squinting, that there, she will, she'll need to take into account the middle on yes. the heels of those results. I think I saw you maybe raising a finger to get in, maybe to disagree with Peter, am I wrong about that? Uh, no, I think uh. it's totally a good point. Um, but, yeah, just, I don't Okay, disagree. well, then in that case, and I apologize for, for misreading, I'm still not used to actually having being people in the office. office. Being there's, face so face. Many, there's so many <laughs> data points to process. Um, Steph, I'm wondering about uh, your thoughts on the outcome of question four, and I'm curious because I think you've been here either virtually or in person before talking about what a long slog this was for the advocates who wanted to get this measure passed into law. Do you think that those advocates are dismayed by the relatively narrow passage of question four, which will keep this law allowing uh, immigrants without legal status to get driver's licenses starting next July? Do you think they're dismayed by how narrow the margin of victory was, or are they just relieved that the law which passed earlier this year is going to stay on the books? I think more than anything, uh, after speaking to some of those organizers, they're relieved. They're also, at least some of them, were pleasantly surprised to see a slightly wider margin than there was for the so-called millionaire's tax ballot mm -hmm. question. Um, there's no doubt that immigration policy and how it filters locally is extremely controversial still, especially outside of uh, greater Boston and some of those gateway cities. But uh, these advocates, I think more than anything, they were fighting tooth and nail to prevent um, sort of just the alternative of what happened, yeah. um, which would have been a first nationwide, uh, considering 16 other states in DC had laws on the books that were not ultimately challenged like this. Um, as of now, I believe their focus is just moving forward, trying to, uh, to focus on implementation ahead of July. You made a point when we were chatting yesterday, just in advance of the show, that hadn't occurred to me. You talked about how significant this new legislation could be for immigrants who currently have legal status but may lose it if Biden and Congress can't do something on immigration and all signs from the past point to them not getting anything done on immigration. Can you just talk a little more about who might benefit if that happens from this law being on the books? Yeah, so in addition to the 200,000 some uh, undocumented immigrants, there are thousands of uh, dreamers or those with deferred action uh, for childhood arrivals, that sort of protection, as well as those with temporary protected status. Now, both of those designations are at risk. Uh, the future is uncertain. There are lawsuits that have uh, punted to Congress. In DACA's case, um, it has allowed DACA to stay relevant for now, but the burden is on Congress to find something. And if a similar situation with TPS, although some of those individuals had their protections extended last night through uh, June 2024. That said, for both of these groups, uh, a new law like this provides a life raft that allows them to, at the very least, drive to work, drive and run their errands and avoid the risk of being pulled over and sort of pulled into the ice pipeline. Thank you for that. It's, it's too easy for me and maybe some viewers to forget 
sort of the flux that can occur when it comes to legal status versus non-legal status that uh, the goalposts shift frequently. Peter, the Mass Republican Party had a terrible night. Yeah. I know that there are some Republicans out there. I talked to a couple of them, I believe, at the uh, party convention. We've talked about it on the show. There are some Republicans who hope that, or who had hoped, that if the party, you know, completely wiped out in this election cycle, that it would shift back toward a Charlie Baker, Charlie Baker brand of Republicanism, as opposed to the embrace of Trumpism that we saw under current party chair Jim Lyons. Do you think that that'll happen? Uh, I wouldn't hang by my toenails. I thought you were going to say that. <laughs> I wouldn't hang by my toenails. I think there will be, there could be a shift. Um, you know, look, they've got to pick the pieces up, and I wouldn't want to make too much of a prediction right now. You know, there's, you know, sort of bodies all over the battlefield to yeah. use an inelegant, uh, an ele inelegant um, metaphor. But... Um, you and I both know moderate Democrats, um, moderate Republicans, who are hoping to regain control mm -hmm. of their party. So we'll see what happens. Steph, Charlie Baker did not have a terrific night either, politically speaking. He endorsed Thomas Hodgson in the Bristol County Sheriff's race, a pretty far-right Republican, very controversial figure. Hodgson lost. He's not going to be sheriff anymore. Baker endorsed in the state auditor's race. He backed Anthony Amore, who was running as a more Baker-esque moderate. He didn't beat Diana DiZaglio. And uh, Becca Rausch held off Sean Dooley in a hotly contested state Senate race. Do those results taken in aggregate tell us anything about the limits on Baker's ability to be a political force once he leaves office, if he wants to? I think uh, it's hard to say when you have such different candidates. I mean. In Bristol County, it seemed very obvious that Charlie Baker's endorsement was for a candidate that was somewhat different than how he built himself. He built yeah. himself as this uh, traditional Republican who was not going uh, to stand for some of the uh, rhetoric and actions that Trump took, uh, and yet he backed someone who uh, aligned himself more with Trump policies, and perhaps it's uh, concerns about immigration or something else, but... Personal loyalty, too. He didn't join the conservative Republican pile on... Yes. Um, Baker. Yeah. The, and so it just... I, I think it's a matter of there being some shifts to the left, uh, speaking of progressive before. I mean, in, in Rausch's case, that was definitely a win for progressives, uh, her defeating Dooley. But... For Baker, maybe it's just a matter of waiting and seeing who emerges as a sort of shining star in the Republican Party who is not aligned with Trump. Or looking elsewhere, once he regroups, maybe his influence is known better in, in states and regions where people think of him and see, you know, America's favorite yeah, That's interesting, yeah. Well, you just did what Peter has spent the better part of the last 20 years doing, which is taking you know my overgeneralizations based on a small <laughs> sample size and telling me to, to relax and not, not get ahead of myself, I'll give you a chance to do it again. Do you think that those three races that I mentioned are in any way a, maybe not a red flag, but a yellow traffic light for Charlie No, Baker? I don't think, I, I, I mean, I, I don't think they're significant beyond election night. And the reason why is that Charlie Baker's a lame duck and there's going to be a whole new political landscape. Take two issues that are going to emerge, I, I believe, in the next 12, in 2023, mm -hmm. that th there's going to be rent, there's going to be the stirrings of um, a move to get rent control or uh, rent stabilization moving, and there's going to be a move to um, adopt, uh, to green light home rule petitions for um, Oh, you mentioned this before, for reparations. For reparations, yep. thank you. My, my brain freeze there. Um, uh, for reparations, we have the town of Amherst is waiting for a change of chief executive, and the city of Boston is still in the planning stages. Now, I'm not going to predict what's going to happen, but think again of my 6% okay. that I'm talking about. Um, the, these are issues that 
Um, I, 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 these are new issues that are going to take over Beacon Hill. I can see, for example, Healy being um, uh, very open to um, social issues, being very, uh, for reparations, being somewhat skeptical mm -hmm. about uh, nuts and bolts issues like rent control. That will come with all sorts of caveats about value transfer taxes and stuff like that. So does that make sense? I think it does. All right, so I'll, I'll heed both of your advice and I'll pull back a little bit from my <laughs> sweeping generalizations. Peter Kadzis, Stuff's the least. Thank you both. Next up, U.S. Attorney Rachel Rollins is under investigation by the Justice Department Inspector General over an appearance she made at a Democratic National Committee fundraiser featuring First Lady Jill Biden over the summer. That's according to the Associated Press, which first reported on the probe earlier this week after months of public scrutiny over Rollins' attendance at the event back in July in Andover, where she was photographed by the Boston Herald. The AP reported the DOJ inspector general is looking into whether the appearance could have violated the Hatch Act, a federal law that limits some political activities for federal employees. The IG is also reportedly looking into Rollins' use of a personal cell phone for official business and a trip that Rollins took to California that was paid for by an outside group, all of which could potentially violate DOJ policies. As is typical, the inspector general declined to comment, but a spokesperson for the U.S. attorney told the AP that Rollins is, quote, fully cooperating with the investigation. I'm joined now by Ron Sullivan, Harvard Law Professor and Director of the Criminal Justice Institute at Harvard and GBH Senior Investigative Reporter Philip Martin. Good to see you both. Uh, Ron, Rollins is reportedly being investigated both by the DOJ and the U.S. Office of Special Counsel in connection with her attendance at that Joe Biden fundraiser. Which of those is more serious? Well, I don't think either are particularly serious given the facts as I understand them. I think that it is, if anything, maybe an administrative uh, error that can get corrected. But um, looking at all of the facts put together, I, I, I sort of think it's a, a nothing burger. Interesting. Uh, can you elaborate on that? Because I know there will be some people watching who will say, wait a minute, how can it be a nothing burger when apparently uh, this may be prohibited by Justice Department policy? She's an, a, a, a political appointee who needs to be nonpartisan to do her job effectively. But here she is participating in an event where the president's wife is raising money. Can you just tell me more about yes. your Nothing Burger take? Yeah, yeah sure. So two reasons. Um, uh, what, the first class of reasons is this. This opportunity to meet with Dr. Biden, as I understand it, was brought to her uh, <coughs> by her office, one. She sought... By Rollins' office? By, by Rollins' okay. office. That's one. Two, she sought and received approval by the executive office of the United States Attorney. Uh, three, she didn't actually go to the fundraiser, she went before it started and left before it, it started. And four, if you look at other news sources, we know that because she was in two public facing events at the time the fundraiser was going on. She mm -hmm. was on a Zoom with Mayor Wu en route uh, in a car on a Zoom uh, with Mayor Wu and en route to meeting with two other mayors about hate crimes. So I think that I don't see a Hatch Act violation there. Maybe they should have met at the coffee shop across the street because it was the same venue. But as I understand the facts, she was not actually there. <clears throat> Excuse me, Philip Martin, uh, do you agree with Ron's nothing burger take or do you have a different take on this? I, I actually agree with Ron. Two I nothing burgers, that, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, I think what, what, we're, what we're seeing here is the headlines are worse than the actual deed uh, and, uh, or alleged deed. And it's it's also, I think we have to put this in context, uh, the 1939 Hatch Act was meant to uh, stop uh, outright uh, uh, politi politicizing uh, civil service positions, uh, those that fell within the purview of the president and the administration, uh, the, the White House, the DOJ. And what we're, what we're seeing is, uh, uh, as Ron said, uh, was an attempt uh, by uh, the U.S. attorney to essentially clarify that. Apparently that clarification was not enough uh, and uh, there may have been a violation. Uh, the, but I think we also have to put this in the context of the moment. Yes. We uh, are just a few years away from an administration, the Trump administration, which uh, at, at, the, at the least 13 members of that administration violated the Hatch Act, not once, but 
consistently. Um, and uh, the and you had a president that basically uh, allowed that to happen. Now, and that's according not, to the U.S. Office of Special Counsel, which is part of this, doing apparently one of the Rollins investigations. So that's, that's established right. by them. Yeah, that's right. And this is not a, a question of both sideisms. It's a question of putting it in context uh, that you have a situation where, uh, again, an administration, the Trump administration, regularly violated the Hatch Act in ways that were egregious. Uh, and uh, to the fact that, I mean, you have to even consider the former U, uh, Attorney General Barr, William Barr, uh, who politicized his office to an extraordinary degree. Look no, no further than the release of the Mueller report and his interpretation of that legal uh, docu document uh, and uh, that legal finding, rather, uh, and how egregious it was that he had largely obscured its findings. Uh, and in, indeed lie about uh, the, its conclusions. Right, when he sort of primed the pump saying this isn't going to be a big deal, when, when you get the full thing, just don't expect, don't expect oh, more, what you might more, be expecting. Yeah. More than a big deal, no, obfuscation and uh, outright um, mm -hmm. obscuration. Can, I, can uh, I add one more context yeah, point? I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's also important to know that uh, this investigation was at the request of a United States senator. Who is the United States senator? It's Tom Cotton from Arkansas. The same United States senator who stood on the floor of the Senate and said, I will not allow Rachel Rollins to become U.S. attorney. Now, this guy is like Pinocchio. His nose goes from Arkansas all the way to the business of the people of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. I think he's got it out for her. I think it's sour grapes because she's got it. Mm -hmm. I expect IOG to follow up on a request from a United States senator, but I think he's overstepping at this point. Just to round out some of that cotton context, he also called her around the time of her confirmation uh, one of the nation's preeminent legal arsonists. That's yes. how he described her and said that she was unfit to serve. Well, let me ask you about uh, uh, both, you know, on the heels of what you just said and of the point that Philip made earlier. Why do you think the DOJ, if in fact there's, there's as little there there as both of you are saying, why would Merrick Garland uh, okay, and by the way, I don't know yeah. internally, maybe, maybe he doesn't have to okay the investigation, but why would his DOJ uh, initiate an investigation on these multiple counts if in fact there's not much going on? And is it connected to ongoing investigations involving former President Trump, do you think? Do you think he is bending over backwards to show that his DOJ is completely above and beyond reproach? I think it's something of, about above and beyond reproach. So I think for a sitting U.S. attorney, you have to avoid substantive violations uh, of the Hatch Act or any other uh, sort of a, administrative obligation, but also the appearance of it as well. So I think that uh, the Attorney General, whom I've known for 25 years, very careful guy, his office is probably bending over backwards to ensure not only that everyone follows the rules, but that nothing appears shady or out of the ordinary, which is why I said at the beginning, maybe they should have gone to a coffee shop across the street. I imagine mm -hmm. the Secret Service would have said, do you know what it would take for us to clear a coffee shop across the street for you to meet for five minutes. Uh, but these are the sorts of things that uh, Ms. Rollins is gonna have to think about. Uh, she, as you know, uh, puts the public in public servant. She's out there. Uh, she likes to meet the public. She likes to do things. She likes to talk to people. Uh, but what she'll realize is there's a big bureaucracy in the Department of Justice, and you've got to dot every I and cross every T, and I'm sure she'll do that. Philip, Ron mentioned uh, Rollins being out there in, in various ways. I want to ask you about the way she initially pushed back uh, at scrutiny of her visit with Jill Biden on Twitter after the Boston Herald wrote a story saying, you know, she did this thing, it may have been problematic. She sent out a tweet saying, I wasn't asked for comment before this ran. It's almost as if the Herald didn't want to know I had approval to meet Dr. Biden and left early to speak at two community events last night. Uh, emoji, a last back to keeping Boston Mass uh, Part 1 crime down. Nice try, though. Philip, do you think that in responding that way, as publicly as she did, um, that, that possibly Rachel Rollins made this situation worse for herself than she needed to? Well, I think Rachel Rollins is being Rachel Rollins. <clears throat> she is, uh, she's assertive, some would say combative, uh, and uh, uh, it's something many people would not have recommended, <clears throat> but she is who she is. She uh, is uh, someone who basically sees herself under attack and is not uh, someone who will back down 
uh, in, in the face of what she considers unfairness. Now, uh, the Herald uh, has, uh, for a long time, both editorially uh, and in its uh, and its reporters have, in fact, had uh, right, Rachel Rollins in her bullseye. They have. It's a totally legitimate story, by the way. If uh, it's something, it's something they pursued uh, journalistically. <clears throat> fine. Uh, but their editorial pages have also zero in on um, on Rachel Rollins. Uh, so there is, in fact, a, an agenda that's framed by the conservative politics. Let me also add something else, uh, Adam. Um, a few weeks ago, <clears throat> Rachel Rollins was supposed to speak at an uh, anti-defamation league breakfast. Uh, I was at that breakfast. She declined. Uh, uh, not she decided not to uh, to speak at that breakfast because she thought it would, in fact be, uh, 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 it would present a, um, hmm. a contradiction or would violate uh, a, um, uh, uh, aspects of the Justice Department rules and regulations because it was so close to uh, an election. This is pre-midterm uh, elections. Uh, and so she is cognizant of this uh, and uh, may have erred in, in terms of uh, this particular uh, situation and it's something that the Herald ran with. Okay. Uh, because, again, I think they, they have, have an agenda, their, I hear you um, saying. Uh, I should mention, by the way, that in, in her program. tweet, she said she hadn't been asked for comment. And I believe that the Herald actually did have a reporter at the event who asked her for comment. She gave a terse response, and, and uh, things went from there. <laughs> Ron, uh, we talked about the other things that are apparently being yeah. investigated by the DOJ, the use of a personal cell phone for official business, and this trip to California paid for by an outside group. I do not know the details there, but might those things be more problematic for Rollins than the appearance at the Biden fundraiser, or is it impossible to say right now? No, I think that uh, probably even less problematic is I understand the California event. It was a technical thing that the, uh, the and, and that the government ended up uh, reimbursing her. It was, oh, you can't get reimbursed from person A, but you can get reimbursed okay. from Institute B. And as I understand the cell phone, it's, uh, you know, it's not like... Uh, Documents at Mar-a-Lago or something. As I as I understand it, mm -hmm. I'm not in the Justice Department. Mm -hmm. But you know it, more than I do. Yeah, so. but it's things things like, uh, 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 hey, is this media statement okay? You're not answering your other phone, uh -huh. and, which may be, you know, to Philip's point, a technical violations. Yeah. And if so, then she'll she'll correct them. But I don't think there's evidence of like a willful breach okay. of protocol. Thank you for that background. Thank you both for the analysis, and thank you for being here. Ron Sullivan, Philip Martin. That's it for tonight, but do come back next week. And please tell us what you think. The email is talkingpolitics at wgbh.org. The website is gbhnews.org slash talkingpolitics, where you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Riley Adam. For now, thanks as always for watching, and good night. Each night on Greater Boston, we go in-depth on important stories, we talk to the people behind those stories, and we bring you expert insight and a wide array of views on issues which you care about and which you should. Greater Boston, Monday through Thursday at 7. It's critically important to remember